What happens when a CPU gets too cold? Well, we know when the opposite happens and it gets too hot that the CPU overheats and loses performance. So what challenges do we face on the flip side when a CPU gets colder and colder? To find out, today we're going to be experimenting with some alternative ways to cool a PC. Starting off simple with the box fan. Placing it right up against the motherboard will give it tons of airflow to help dissipate heat. But as of right now, we're only moving around room temperature air. So by introducing some bags of ice, we can lower that surrounding air temperature. And just like that, we have our first cooling setup. So let's turn on the PC PC to see if it actually helps. With the box fan turned off, we can see the normal temperature of the CPU in the system is around 37, 39 degrees Celsius. And so now if we crank up the fan to its highest setting, anecdotally I do feel tons of cold air being blown onto the motherboard. And if we take a look at the actual graph, you can see that the temperature has already dropped over 10 degrees Celsius. Honestly that's not too bad, but we can do a whole lot better. So we'll remove the ice in the fan and replace it with a modern marvel, the air conditioning unit. I found this portable one on Craigslist for $100, which is cheaper than some AIOs, but it will require some modification to work with our system. Essentially, we need to create a direct connection from the output of cold air on the AC unit to the CPU itself. And thanks to a bit of duct tape and elbow grease, we're all set. And now the AC unit's liquid refrigerant is basically directly cooling the air in between itself and the CPU. With that, we can power on the computer one more time. So after logging on and setting up our monitoring programs, we can again see that 37 to 39 degree base temperature. Powering on the AC unit reveals that its default temperature is 66 degrees Fahrenheit or around 19 degrees Celsius. It quickly spins to life speed out hot air in its back in tandem with the cold air out the nozzle. And again, anecdotally, this air feels even colder than the setup with the box fan and ice. And it turns out it can get even colder, going down to its limit of 62 degrees Fahrenheit or around 16.6 degrees Celsius. Taking a look at the CPU temperature graph, you can see that we're starting to walk our way down towards the high 20s, low 30s. <laughs> but this is just getting started. After the AC unit has had some time to warm up, or I guess cool down, we end up hitting 19 degrees Celsius for the first time in this experiment. But the temperature drops don't stop there. Over the course of a few minutes, the CPU temperature continues to decrease until we hit our first single digit measure. That's honestly absurd and shows just how good the AC unit is at cooling our PC. But can we do even better? Of course we can! It's time to break out the dry ice. You want to see something crazy? This here CPU is room temperature, and there's no speeding up in this video. After being in contact with dry ice for mere seconds, the entire IHS starts to frost over. This happens because dry ice is simply that cold, clocking in at negative 100 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 70 degrees Celsius. So what happens if we use it to cool our CPU? Well, we'll grab a chunk of the dry ice and then put it on top of this conveniently placed heatsink. And now this is one of the most absurd things I've ever seen. You ready for it? Keep an eye on this temperature. <laughs> That's right, it drops to zero degrees Celsius. Zero degrees! And it would drop further, but the measuring tool just simply doesn't go below zero. And remember, this is passively cooled with the dry ice. There's no fan moving air around this. It's just the dry ice. It's safe to assume that the CPU is hitting temperatures between negative 60 and negative 70 degrees Celsius. And at these temperatures, the first signs of trouble start to transpire. But before we talk about that, I'd like to take a moment to thank today's video sponsor. PCBWay is a one-stop shop for all of your tech tinkering needs. From custom PCB fabrication and assembly, to 3D printing, CNCing, and even injection molding, PCBWay offers quality manufacturing delivered right to your doorstep. It's a great service to make that side project you have in mind come to life, but even if you don't have a project in mind, PCBWay's open source community has you covered. Every week, a handful of user-generated PCB files, 3D prints, and other designs are showcased for you to view, get inspired, and to try out for yourself. This Sheikah Slate project, for example, looks really cool. I love it when you can find little Easter eggs baked directly in to the PCBs themselves. So if you're up for it, here you can also vote on the designs that you like the most, and even submit your very own projects for others to see. But now, if you're still a bit hesitant to get started with custom boards, another thing to consider is that when you register a new account with PCB Way, you'll also receive a $5 welcome bonus, and the cost of 10 custom PCB boards also happens to be $5. So definitely worth checking out to get you over the hump. Thanks again to PCB Way for sponsoring today's video. You can check them out with the top link in the description below. Now returning to our dry ice CPU experiment, if you take a close look at the heatsink and surrounding motherboard, you might be able to notice these small droplets of liquid starting to form. You might think this is due to the dry ice melting and turning into liquid, but the thing about dry ice is that it evaporates when it warms up, it doesn't turn into liquid at all. So these droplets are coming from somewhere else entirely, and the culprit is condensation. 
The same thing happens when you place a cold glass of water on the counter during a hot summer day. You'll notice the outside of the glass becomes wet due to the temperature difference between the cold air inside and the warmer air outside. When air is cooled to a temperature below its dew point, its moisture capacity becomes reduced, causing airborne water vapor to turn into liquid. So these droplets on our computer are not melted dry ice, but actually just H2O, which as you may know does not mix nicely with electronics due to its keen ability to conduct electricity and cause electrical shorts. So condensation poses a serious issue when a CPU gets too cold, but what are some ways to circumvent this? The answer, surprisingly, can likely be found in your bathroom medicine cabinet. If you've ever watched a video of an extreme overclocker preparing for, say, pouring liquid nitrogen directly on a CPU, you might have noticed that their first step is covering the motherboard in a coat of Vaseline. This hydrophobic coat acts as insulation between the motherboard and the surrounding air, creating a barrier for water vapor to form on it when it condenses without it being directly in contact with these sensitive electronics. And as a side note, nail polish can also be used for this same effect in place of Vaseline, but is slightly more of a permanent solution because it's a lot more difficult to clean up. Alright, so condensation is a problem that can be accounted for, but what other issues crop up when we reach these sub-zero temperatures? Well, to find out, we now need to take a closer look at our thermal paste. Serving as the layer directly between our CPU and heatsink, thermal paste's job is to replace any and all air pockets between these two surfaces to more efficiently transfer heat. And it does a fantastic job at this between the temperatures of 130 degrees Celsius at the high end and negative 50 degrees Celsius on the low end. But wait a minute, we're outside the bounds of this range now, leaning much closer to negative 60 and 70 degrees Celsius than the limit of negative 50. And so outside of this range, you can quickly see how stiff and rigid our once viscous thermal paste has now become. Depending on the chemical ingredients and makeup of our specific thermal paste, this rigidity will often lead to the paste cracking. And when this occurs in our PC, it introduces gaps in our cooling system with air taking its place. Which means at this point, our thermal paste is no longer bridging our heat source and our heat sink, leading to very inefficient thermal transfer. On top of that, this situation becomes even more drastic if we have any type of liquid metal thermal paste inside of the IHS of our CPU. And while it's not the most common situation in the world, it's certainly familiar to overclocking enthusiasts to put some liquid metal inside of the CPU. At room temperature, it certainly outperforms normal thermal paste, but in these extreme cold situations, the liquid metal becomes even more rigid than normal thermal paste. And due to its proximity to the actual CPU die and caches, it presents an extremely dangerous threat of physically scratching these internal components. The solution this time around is simply to use thermal paste that's specifically made for these really low temperatures, and to avoid using liquid metal thermal paste altogether. Alright, so now that we've circumnavigated the threat of both condensation and the cracking of our thermal paste at these temperatures of around negative 60 to 70 degrees Celsius, it's time to get even colder. And I mean, a lot colder. To do so, we need to leave the confines of our studio and find a cryogen lab. As the CPU's temperature drops lower and lower into the negative 200s of degrees Celsius, we in fact can enter an entirely new form of computing altogether, specifically the world of quantum computing. Quantum computing requires quantum CPUs, and inside of these quantum processors, even minuscule amounts of heat can cause errors within the storage of qubits, which are essentially the building blocks of a quantum PC. Because of this, we need to store a quantum CPU you at temperatures colder than space itself, which is mind-boggling. But if dry ice can only get us down to around negative 70 degrees Celsius, how in the world can we get nearly four times colder than that? Well, one method that is currently being used by researchers is a cryogen-free dilution refrigeration system that has several stages of cooling mechanisms, but mainly relying on the evaporation of helium isotopes as a refrigerant. This allows space to be cooled to fractions of degrees above the coldest theoretical temperature possible, which is also known as absolute zero. And for context, it's around negative 273 degrees Celsius. That said, there is an alternative cooling method being explored to replace these large refrigerated rooms. And this new method has proven to allow for similar types of extreme cooling while keeping the rest of the room at normal temperature. And the solution is none other than lasers. That's right, this is the cutting edge technology of laser cooling. Through the process of launching specific wavelengths of light at a microscopic level at individual molecules making up an object, laser cooling can add momentum in the opposite direction that these molecules are currently moving, which in effect slows everything down and massively reduces the temperature of the entire system. It honestly feels like it's out of a sci-fi movie or something, but it actually works, which is incredible. Now currently this method has constraints about cooling large surface areas, so for it to cool the entire surface of say a CPU might require some time. But that said, if this technology can scale to the point where you can install it inside of your own PC, well at that point your CPU will be very close to becoming a superconductor. At these unfathomable low temperatures of approaching absolute zero, your processor would effectively be able to transfer electricity through it with no resistance whatsoever, also leading to 
no heat whatsoever. Which, if you ask me, is the ultimate endgame for a cooling system within your computer. One that produces no heat at all. So therefore, yes, there are certainly challenges when a CPU gets colder and colder and colder. But as we've seen today, the benefits of having a cold CPU far outweigh the consequences. And in our typical PCs with liquid or air cooling, we actually never have to deal with these consequences anyway. But that said, this was still a fun topic to explore. So that's all I have for you today. I'm Mr. Yeaster. Thank you for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one. To stay cool out there, but not too cold. Heh <laughs>